church. Welcome to all who are gathering in person, those who are joining us virtually. Um, we're just glad to be together and that you're a part of our worship today. This is October 10th, and that date holds a lot of significance for me. It is my parents' anniversary, and of course it is now celebrated in heaven. But it is also the date that they chose to have me baptized. So I always remember the date of my baptism because it was on my parents' wedding anniversary. So we are continuing this series called Unravel. You know, what, what happens when our plans or when life seems to be coming apart? And how do we seek God in those times? when it seems as if life has become unraveled. So one of the things that we're doing right now in confirmation is we're looking at three, John Wesley's three simple rules. What do you think, Patrick? Should I give him a test? Sure. Sure. <laughs> I'm just wondering, does anybody know the three simple rules? Uh-oh. How about you, Patrick? You can think of one. Love God. Yeah, that's the third one. So it's do no harm, do good, fall in love with God. So we're looking at do no harm right now in confirmation. So I'm going to pick on you for just a minute, Patrick. What's one thing that we sometimes do that causes harm? Uh-oh. It was just Wednesday. I think what you wrote was sometimes the way we treat other people. We can do harm. So how about the rest of you? What are the ways in which we can do harm? Lying. Lying. That's a good one. What else? I couldn't hear that. Sinning. Sinning? Definitely. What else? Think about some of the things we're dealing with today. What are some ways in which we might be doing harm that we should be avoiding? Gossip. Didn't hear that. Gossip. Gossip. Yes, that did come up Wednesday night when we talk about other people. What else? I guess the one that comes to mind for me is climate change. You know, what are we doing? Sometimes we can be so overwhelmed 
that we're not sure there's anything we can do to make a difference, and yet we can. Even in our simple behaviors, we can do no harm. So that, that's what's happening in confirmation right now. And you, you know, you, you never know, you might get a quiz again, so you might want to try to remember what those simple rules are. But John Wesley and the general rules that he designed for the church that we still follow, um, thought that those three brought in exactly when it's what the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. But then these three simple rules were the way in which to live. So today, in our story, we are going to witness what happens in the midst of a flash of light and unraveling of the plans and even the identity of Saul. So let's acknowledge God's presence in our lives at all times, but especially with us in worship today by singing, Surely the Presence. Thank you. 
So I'm wondering if you all know how to play a game. If I do this and do this, what do you do? Peekaboo! <laughs> Can we do that? Peekaboo! Come on, join me. Let's do it together. Peekaboo! Wow, it's fun, isn't it? We cover our eyes. And then we uncover them. And we can see everything. So what would happen if our eyes stayed covered all the time? What would happen? We wouldn't be able to see anything, would we? Now, how would we walk down those steps or go back where we were seated if we couldn't see? What would we need? You could feel, yeah. What else could you do? You could get a helper, couldn't you? Yes, a helper. Yeah, sometimes people can't see. And they don't see everything around them. And sometimes what they have to do then is learn how to find in the world by feel. They might have a helper that walks with them to make sure that they don't trip. Sometimes they use a stick. Have you ever seen those white sticks? That they use so they can feel if there's a bump or a step or anything in their way. Yeah. When we can't see, we need helpers. So our, that's what our Bible story is about today. Oh my goodness. But that's what our Bible story is about today. It's about a man who's walking along. All of a sudden, there's a bright light, and he can't see. And he's never had that problem before. All of a sudden, the whole world around him disappears. Yeah. yeah. And so there had to be people to help him. Because he hadn't learned yet what to do when he couldn't see. Sometimes in life we need helpers, don't we? We need someone to help us through a difficult time. If we get a if we get an owie, we need somebody to help, don't we? Yeah. We need helpers in our lives. So today you can hear the story of a man who needed helpers until he could see again. And you know what? When he could see again, he became a helper. And he taught a lot of people about Jesus. Shall we pray about that? Okay, let's pray. Jesus, we need those helpers. And thank you that at our time of need, you provide them for us. Sometimes it's a difficult day. Sometimes it's something that overwhelms us. And sometimes it's something that needs help because it hurts or it's different. And so we thank you for all the helpers that come into our lives. And we thank you that you can take even the most difficult times in our lives to teach us and help us to love others. So thank you for helpers and thank you for letting us be helpers. And all God's children said, Amen. All right. Thank you all for coming up. It does become a bit challenging to work around masks, microphones, but I think it's important that we do what we can to help and protect one another.
And I think sometimes when we come to times of confession, that's really the call on our lives. That there are opportunities for us to be the helpers in the lives of others. Opportunities that we really do not want to miss. We want to take advantage of those opportunities that are placed before us because God is inviting us to be a helper in someone else's life. And on the other side of that, sometimes we need help. And God will give us courage so we can ask for that help. So let's join together in this responsive prayer of confession this morning. And then I'm just going to give you a few moments of silence just to reflect on your own life. God of new life, what would we give to have you appear in a flash of light and a clear voice like you did for Saul? Maybe then our doubts would disappear. Maybe then we would live as you called us to live. However, when our lives depend on faith, we forget your surprising grace. Instead, we draw lines around enemies and friends, who's in and who's out. We see the others faster than we see our neighbor and refuse second chances. Pull the scales from our eyes. Help us see as you see. Help us live as you live and forgive us when we fail to. Humbly we pray. Amen. join together in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the great sower, who weaves us together in community, collecting our loose ends and turning them into belonging. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who hems us in before and behind, catching us when we fall and writing us into God's holy narrative. And I believe in Jesus Christ, who loved and claimed people society had thrown out refusing to disregard anyone as scrap. I believe God has woven part of God's self into the fiber of our being, making us inherently worthy of love and belonging. I believe the fabric of my life is weak, that I am prone to error and need God's handiwork to remind me of love. I believe in the church, and that like a quilt of different fabrics, she is designed to be as diverse and beautiful as God's creation. And I believe that when life unravels, God is there to stitch my wounds together, to hold me in the palm of God's hand, to tell me of love, and to invite me in to a new journey. Amen. So I'm doing something a little different this morning. It's not that I'm skipping it in the bulletin, but I'm going to be reading the scripture as part of my message this morning. So it is, it is still before you, but instead of my reading straight through, you will hear it all through the message. So this is a message about removing scales from our eyes. Have you ever been in a dark place, a really dark place? How many of you have? I can remember a time entering a cave. And you know how when you enter from the light to dark, your eyes have to adjust? I realized that it wasn't my eyes trying to adjust. It was really that dark. And the person who was guiding us did that intentionally. Brought us in and let us stand in that darkness in silence. That was an entirely different experience for me because it almost felt like this darkness was thick and smothering. I lost all my points of reference and how I orient my world into that moment of darkness. And in a sense it was, just for those moments, the experience of being truly blind. Of course in a moment we were allowed to turn on the lights and they had some lights in the cave that they turned on. We could use our flashlights, but for those moments, 
it was an amazing experience. You know, we live in a world that we don't have darkness, do we? There's a street light. There's a farmyard light. There's lights on in our homes all the time. And it, in many ways, it has upset our circadian rhythm in our lives because we don't have darkness. You know, think back, being a farming community, think back to the early days of farming. You farmed while it was light. And you went to bed when it was dark. <coughs> We've lost that rhythm because there's always light. I know I've talked to my siblings, the ones who live in more populated areas, and they talk about the fact that they can maybe see two stars because there's so much light in their community. Those moments of experienced blindness were unfamiliar. I never realized that I'd never been in total black. And for those moments, let's be honest, it was pretty disconcerting. So I want you to think this morning about a time when you were walking in a very dark place. Maybe you've been in a cave like my story. Maybe you're walking in the woods and that tree canopy is so heavy that for those moments it feels as dark as night. There are times when we've had storms coming through and we've lost the power and it seems like night outside, that experience of darkness. And maybe it's even being down in your basement forgetting to turn the light on. Now imagine as you come out of that darkness, you enter a place of bright light, stepping outside. And maybe you look up and you look straight into the sun for just a brief moment. How does that feel when that happens? When you go from dark to light, how does that feel? Well, it's almost painful, isn't it? It's like you have to close your eyes for a minute, you have to blink for a minute, you have to adjust. In that moment, that time between darkness and light, that light can even blind and disorient us. In our story today, we encountered two men who had a moment like that. Both men were walking in a form of darkness, and both men had a disruptive encounter with the light. So let's start into our story to see what I'm talking about. And our book, our text is found in Acts. It's actually a story of four people. The first person is a man named Saul. Well, in Acts, we have encountered Saul back in chapter 7. The religious leaders had dragged Stephen into the street and bludgeoned him to death with stones. And Saul stood by like this and approved of what was happening. Who is this guy? There are three important things to know about Saul. First, he was a Jewish man. He was born in the Greek town of Tarsus, far away from Jerusalem. Second, he was a Roman citizen. That was very rare for a Jewish man. Third, he chose to move to Jerusalem and train as a Pharisee. He was a devout Pharisee and teacher of the law of Moses. He loved his country and was violently opposed to anyone whom he considered to be a blasphemer. He actually blamed the lawbreakers as the reason why God had not delivered them from the Roman Empire. So let's see what happens to Saul. We're starting, we're going to read now 1 through 9. All this time, Saul was breathing down the neck of the master's disciples out for the kill. He went to the chief priest and got arrest warrants to take to the meeting places in Damascus, so that if he found anyone there belonging to the way, whether men or women, he could arrest them and bring them to Jerusalem. He set off. When he got to the outskirts of Damascus, he was suddenly dazed by a blinding flash of light. As he fell to the ground, he heard a voice. Saul, Saul, why are you out to get me? He said, Who are you, Master? I am Jesus, the one you're hunting down. 
I want you to get up and enter the city. In that city, you will be told what to do next. His companions stood there dumbstruck. They could hear the sound, but they couldn't see anyone. While Saul, picking himself up from the ground, found himself stone blind. They had to take him away by hand and lead him into Damascus. He continued blind for three days. He ate nothing. He drank nothing. Now let's look at the second person in verses 10 through 16. There was a disciple in Damascus by the name of Ananias. The master spoke to him in a vision. Ananias. Yes, master, he answered. Get up and go over to Straight Avenue. Ask at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus. His name is Saul. He's there praying. He just had a dream in which he saw a man named Ananias enter the house and lay hands on him so he could see again. Ananias protested, Master, you can't be serious. Everyone's talking about this man and the terrible thing he's been doing, his reign of terror against your people in Jerusalem. And now he's shown up here with papers from the chief priests that give him the license to do the same to us. But the master said, Don't argue, go. I have picked him as my personal representative to non-Jews and kings and Jews. And now I'm about to show him what he's in for, the hard suffering that goes with this job. Okay, so let's pause here for just a moment. Put yourself in Ananias' position. You're a disciple of Jesus. You've heard that Saul is on the rampage. He's killed before, and you and your family might be next. So how open would you be to the Lord's message? Before we start, finish reading our story and talk more about Ananias, I want to talk about the third person in the story, the risen Christ. This is who Saul encounters on the road. Saul later becomes known as the Apostle Paul and spreads the good news of Jesus across the Roman Empire and fights for racial unity between Jews and Gentiles. What I find fascinating is that the Jesus that Paul knows is a, not exactly the same Jesus that Peter, James, John, and the original disciples knew. They got to hang out with Jesus, who was fully human. They fished together, they ate together, they sat around the fire and they told stories together. This Jesus that Saul encounters is the risen Christ. Saul encounters him as a blinding light and a voice. Ananias encounters the risen Christ as a vision and a voice. As we continue our story, we see two men who are transformed, continuing in our passage. So Ananias went and found the house, placed his hands on blind Saul, and said, Brother Saul, the master sent me, the same Jesus you saw on your way here. He sent me so you could see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. He could see again. He got to his feet, was baptized, and sat down with them for a hearty meal. Saul spent a few days getting acquainted with the Damascus disciples, but then went right to work, wasting no time, preaching in meeting places that Jesus was the Son of God. They were caught off guard by this, and not all sure that they could trust him. And they kept saying, Isn't this the man who wreaked havoc in Jerusalem among the believers? And didn't he come here to do the same thing, arrest us, and drag us off to jail in Jerusalem for sentencing by the high priest? Well, this is a very dramatic story, isn't it? A villain struck down in a flash of light. Jesus' disembodied voice calling him out. Saul might be assumed to be the bad guy in our story, but is he? It's important to remember that Saul sees himself as the good guy, trying to protect the faith. Saul loves God and wants to get rid of anything or anyone who dishonors God. And he has his sights on the Jewish people who are following this Jesus movement. And he is said to be breathing threats and murder. 
against disciples of Jesus in his zeal. He sees those in the Jesus movement, the followers, as those within his faith, being needing to be rescued from the error of their ways. He asks for letters to the synagogues in Damascus that might give him the authority to continue his work there. As far as Saul is concerned, he is doing the righteous work for God. And this is about to change. Perhaps Saul is unsettled in fear. Fear that his Jewish tradition is changing. Fear that even who he is is suddenly on shaky ground. Fear that even his faith is threatened. Fear can make someone act in ways that are defensive and even violent. And as he goes on his way, carrying his letters that were authorized his continued reign of terror, that's when, in that moment, that this flash of light blinds him, and he falls to the ground in fear. And he hears a booming voice from the sky, the same voice that called Abraham and Sarah to be the parents of God's people, the same voice that called from a burning bush to compel Moses to confront Pharaoh, the same voice that spoke to the prophet Jeremiah, the same voice that cried out from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. That same voice brings Saul to his knees with an accusation that tells Saul he's messed with the wrong God. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Not why are you persecuting those who follow me, but why do you persecute me? Why do you persecute me? That God's indictment is a reminder to us all that what we do to the most vulnerable around us is what we do to the very God we claim to love and serve. We have a powerful reminder in the words of Jesus in Matthew 25. Whatever you do for the least of these, you do to me. Saul hears this question and has no response. But if we use our imaginations, we might come up with a few that he might have offered had he not been so frightened. He could have defended himself. Not only was he not persecuting Jesus, he was doing the work of God. But Saul is too dumbstruck to say anything cowering in fear. How could anyone possibly make excuses in that moment? God commands Saul to continue to Damascus and await further instructions. And at this point in the narrative, Saul is utterly and completely helpless. First of all, he's totally blind. Secondly, he has no idea what is waiting for him or if, some, if he somehow manages to get himself safely to his destination. But it's not exactly like he has a choice. He's blind with nothing but the kindness of traveling companions to guide him. The man who had been the one to be feared is now a helpless creature stumbling around blindly, being led by the hands of his inferiors, Saul, who had been the number one predator of the Jesus movement, is now heading to the house of one of the followers of Jesus, vulnerable and exposed. He gets to the house in Damascus and finds not horror, but hospitality. He is cared for during his blindness. For three days, hold up and helpless, he depends on the grace of the very people he had made it his life's work to persecute. For three days, in the echoes of the conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus, it is as if he has gone back to the womb in order to be reborn as something new. For three days, Saul is in the dark, a forced exercise of vulnerability and humility. But then Ananias shows up. And although he's understandably hesitant at first, he agrees to obey God's command to minister to this person that he has been taught to avoid. Ananias walks up to Saul, and before saying a word, places his hands on him. I wonder if Saul flinched. Wonder if this was going to be the moment they finally got their revenge and put an end to his persecution. 
but instead of a violent touch, he found a gentle one, a touch that restored his sight. In that moment, not only is he changed, but the view of Ananias had of the family of God is also unraveled. He has discovered the inclusive nature of God. He has been transformed from an enemy into a brother. And then the scales fell. Flaky scales fall from his eyes and falls away. Everything falls away. All the prejudice, all the fire breathing, all the hatred and discrimination and divisive political rhetoric, all that falls away. And Saul sees. Not just physically, but spiritually, emotionally, vocationally, he now sees. Saul finds a new path, and he now has a new name to go along with that path, Paul. Paul's identity as a persecutor of the followers of Jesus is unraveled, and he's invited on a new path. The touch on his eyes restores much more than his physical sight. He now sees the everything in a new way, including his relationship with God. His responsibility in that relationship is to share this invitation with others into the new life of which he is now a part. It is a holy, fresh start. When I began, remember I said there were four people. The first was Saul. Then we spoke of Ananias. Then we spoke of the risen Christ. So who is the fourth? We are. We are the fourth. So the question for us today is, what are the shadows in which we hide? What are the reasons that cause us to see a person that is different from us and live in fear and hatred? What needs to be unraveled so we can see and love as Jesus does? The risen Christ shines a bright light of truth into each of our lives today. That light drives away the shadows and exposes the truth that all people, everyone, all people, are children of God. And the good news that Jesus brings is for all people. The good news disrupts our systems that divide and judge and calls us into the scary and difficult world of reaching out beyond the boundaries and seeking reconciliation and ways to say, brother, sister, in Christ we are one. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, what a dramatic story. What an amazing moment in the life of a man who had lost his way, who had thought what he believed and what he wanted to do was the only right path there was. We thank you that we can see that awakening in his life, that we can see the awakening that occurred in the life of Ananias, the awakening that occurred in that fledgling new community of believers. And we can see the force that Paul became to continue to spread your word, your message, your truth. That work that continues for us today. We too are the ones that have that light available. We, too, are the ones who have available to us the Holy Spirit as it was given to Saul, who became Paul. We, too, have the opportunity to build the world that you intend, one person at a time. Lord, we thank you, because our lives are so good, so different, so empowered because of you. Amen. So 
beloved, the suffering of the world we see constantly. It's on our TV, we hear it on the radio, we see this concern of medical staff and people in the hospitals. We see concerns in our borders. And as we watch, often we are touched and tears do spill down our cheeks. So when we take offering, we gather them. We gather that to continue the work and to explore the work that God is calling us to do. So today, it is a renewal. It is not just what is in that plate at the back of the church, but it is a time to rededicate ourselves, to offer ourselves fully. Let's sing the doxology to do that.
us rejoice in you. Holy One, our strength rises up with joy in your deliverance. You know our every action, and you lift those who stumble. We pray that your peace would shatter the weapons of war, that your justice would humble those who fill themselves to overflowing, that those who are starving would find food in abundance. We pray for lives that fear barren, feel barren, for hearts that are bereaved, for all who are trapped by the power of death. We pray for these dear ones who are close to our hearts, and we think of those that we have lifted today, and those that you have lifted in your silence. You, Lord, turn death into life. You, Lord, turn poverty into wealth, and tear down the unjust wealth that drives others into poverty. When the world sweeps away those who are poor like dust, and tosses out those in need as if they were garbage, you lift them up and restore them to honor. You who establish the pillars of the earth, guard our hearts and guide our feet, so that we might be now and ever faithful to your world-transforming covenant faithfulness. We pray in Jesus' name, who prays with us as we seek your kingdom. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn comes from the Faith We Sing 2281, and we will sing this through twice. <laughs> Thank you.